Mr. Lee, I'm glad that we've made such progress today. And uh, I hope that we can both say that every step towards stability has been fruitful and exciting. Well, I... Oh, well, let me finish. Let's go through again the problem that we are facing here. We have both agreed that you are going through an identity crisis with a severe case of agoraphobia, or heightened sense of anxiety and fear of everything around you, including ordinary objects like, say, uh, this pen. Ah. I see we've gotten over the fear of ordinary objects. Well done, Mr. Lee. And what say you be end of this very productive session with a wonderful relaxation exercise with a CD player? Hmm? Where did I put that CD player? Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I beg your pardon? <clears throat> Patient now convinced that he is a medical practitioner and has shockingly successfully diagnosed all of his issues as if they were mine. I beg your pardon? The patient remains fully unaware of this fact and continues to possess my identity. Uh, please, <laughs> sit, Mr. Vincent. Sit. Now, uh, there is no CD player in this office, <laughs> yes. Quite right. I had taken it home to use on my daughter's birthday two weeks ago. I'm glad your memory hasn't yet failed you. Mr. Vincent, uh, let me try to explain in layman terms. Uh, what is happening here is you are making an attempt to use up my identity in order to find your own. Now, being under my care for several months now, you have obviously come to learn of my personality, lifestyle, vernacular, cadence, and have gotten so accustomed to it that you have unintentionally slipped yourself into my identity <laughs> as a means of escape of the fear of not being able to find your own. Now, assuming someone else's personality, Mr. Vincent, is not the solution, <laughs> I'm afraid. But there is one, and I will help you through it. Yes. Mr. Lee, I'm afraid your condition is starting to worsen. You are, as you have mentioned, attempting to use up my identity in order to find your own. But that is not the case. You are not the doctor. You are the patient, and I am the doctor. And your name is? Dr. Frank Vincent, and you are Mr. Simon Lee. The patient has assumed my identity, but not my name. Note, possible assumption of a similar, but not identical identity compared to mine. The patient has retained his name, perhaps, to assimilate, not replace himself in my position. Progress. Mr. Lee, can I, I request that you not use that vocal recording device? I am the only one who needs to track our progress here, not you. Uh, Mr. Vincent, I think... I think that's enough for the day, yes? It's not you who gets to decide what's enough for the day, Mr. Lee. <laughs> because, quite frankly, I, I grow very tired of this, this game and this folly. Uh, will you please cease us at once, please, so that I may go home to my wife and daughter, eat a marvellous meal of lamb shank and mash, and watch reruns of Black Adder. Now, will you please let me do this? Please let me carry on with my life so that you may carry on with yours. Please. I would love to do that, but the problem is you are not Dr. Frank Vincent. I am Dr. Frank Vincent. There is no Dr. Frank Vincent. It's Dr. Simon Lee. Me, Dr. Simon Lee. I have a bloody certificate for crying out loud. All right. Let's see it then. Excuse me? Well, if you claim to be the doctor, well, let's see your certificate. Very well. Bloody absurd. Well, it's just, uh, I usually leave it here with my papers. Uh, it doesn't seem to be here in this point in time. Because, Mr. Simon Lee, it is not you who is the doctor, it is I, Dr. Frank Vincent, and my certificate is kept over here in this drawer. That is odd. It's normally kept here with my patient files. It just doesn't seem to be here at this point in time. <laughs> You! You stole my certificate in an attempt to steal my identity! No, 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 
no, no, no, no, you stole my certificate and this is all a ruse to make me look like a fool. Give me back my certificate at once or I'm going to call the police. No, you give me back my certificate or I will call the police. Actually, I grow tired of this game. Give me back my certificate at once or I will call hospital security to have you sedated. Oh, will you? I will call hospital security and you will answer to the no, law I'm for impersonating a medical practitioner. Margaret, could you please come in here? This patient doesn't seem to Margaret, be Margaret, please very come well in here. There's a man who's assuming my identity. Just, could you and please it's just, just... Margaret, thank God you're here. Margaret, thank you. Excuse goodness. me. The both of you are not allowed in here. Please wait in the room outside for Dr. Varela to come back from his lunch break and step away from his personal desk. Mr. Simon Lee, you're on for the two o'clock slot, so you may wait in here. Mr. Frank Vincent, I'm assuming? You are early. Your appointment is at three. Please wait outside until your turn is called, and if I see something like this again, gentlemen, I will call security. <laughs> thank, uh, you. thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you everyone for coming down today. My name is Andrew and... My name is Benjamin. And today we're going to bring you a selection of works, um, different forms of art that all revolve around the themes of struggling with identity right. and um, coping with certain insecurities and also embracing your vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. It's about... Um, Embracing how weird you are and how weird you can be inside and not being afraid of it. Hashtag, keep it weird. Yeah. Keep it weird, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, one of the forms we're going to bring to you is a spoken word, and Andrew is going to start us off. Andrew. Yeah. This piece is uh, it's called Bubble. When I was 10, music was a handful of crayons in the back of my head, bleeding color steadily into the gray matter. I memorized all the lyrics to every song I ever knew, read lyric books and scores, read squinty eye till my head got sore, and I felt rhythm beating in my bones. This itch of a beat that would never leave me, this tick or a flea that always bit me and sent me an open door in the song that I could step into. I was the architect to my heaven, and jazz was a mellow auburn dusk, filled with autumn leaves that danced precariously and precociously across sailboats and teddy bears, plastered across my midnight blue wall, and I wanted it to open up like the mouth of God to me so that I could linger slowly in the sweet slumber of a record, feel the sound wave straight past my teeth and up into this thing we call a brain that spent not nearly as much time as I'd like thinking about what it means to be alive. I knew all the lyrics to every song I ever knew and I would sing them. I would spend hours in a day singing them inside and outside of my head until my lungs heaved hoarse with adventure and held my heart in a little paper basket asking it to hold on a little longer. Breathe, he'd say. Breathe and believe that this love for what you hear can grow a little bigger and will one day become this castle that you build in the sky that holds the clouds up, that holds on to the dreams of everything that sleeps beneath it and rains down on them like candy to the outstretched arms of a baby full of wonder singing somewhere beyond the sea, somewhere waiting for me. My lover stands on golden sands and watches the ships that go sailing. When I was 10, I held my heart in my hand and felt whispers escape from the veins that wrapped around it like a honeycomb, and I would listen. It would sing, and I would listen. It would sing, and it would croon. It would swing, 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 and I would dance with my heart in the bubble that I had formed against the rest of the world, in the bubble that promised to cover my ears when my hands were too busy fighting away the words that flew too close for comfort, shaving away my blunt edges until I fit into the mold they squeezed themselves into. I was 10 years old, I was fat, I was sad, and I was angry, but I never ran. I carved my scars onto choruses and time signatures, spread my maudlin mind over bridges and chords. I let my mind speak into the music. Because the only thing that was listening was the music. The only friend that would listen was the music. These festivals pressed thin into laser discs and cassette tapes were the only things that would come alive in an electric box and sit down with me to put out the fires in my veins and start me up again, pushing through the pollution in my heart. And I would be amazed every single time at how something so small could hold an entire universe in the rings that spun webs of magic in my eardrums. I was 10 years old. I was sad, I was fat, and I was angry. But these days, I'm only one out of the three. I spend way too much time thinking about what it means to be alive and not enough time thinking about what it meant to be alive, and I'm looking for answers everywhere. I'm sitting there on the indent. My body is beaten into my bed. I pull out an old plastic case. George Benson, 
greatest hits. I let my mind crawl like a caterpillar and cocoon itself in the blanket my heart is knitting. And I feel my childhood lick the hair of my nose and pull me into a world that I created. A world that only I believed in. A world that only I knew the directions to. Thank you. Are you rich? Let's put some things in perspective. You and I ain't born based on a directive, but the fact is, our lives are locked by this singular word. Don't blame society, mentality of the herds. There are four definitions of rich. The first one's funny, wealthy, having a great deal of assets or money. But it's not remotely funny that some kid in your class, and you don't notice, but he thinks of himself as the last person you want to hang with you got your fancy toys and towers, while his dad works two jobs so ungodly hours. And he's been fighting this fight ever since he was eight, trying to split five dollars over date by date by date, while his mom fights through chemo. She's his only hero. But ten grand a month in the medical bills, not every hero makes it over every hill. So he grows up, wishing his shoes were a little nicer, his clothes, his watch, daddy's car was a little nicer, or that he even had a car. So when he picks him up from school, while other kids jump into rides, really cool, he's got to walk with his own man and his big umbrella. Walk brisk. Can't even bear to look behind. And I wish to death I could bend space and time and say, listen, poor is a state of mind. The currency of your heart is stronger any time. Some people will judge you based on social status or money. Some people are so poor, all they have is money. We're born into wealth, our lives, a collective of a wellspring of good thoughts and bad thoughts where happiness is subjective. So, you decide to check your bank book. Feel that sickly weight on your shoulders and you can't look. But still, you look around when everybody in town is labeling you high class, middle class, lower class. Judgment abounds. So that's what this is. Humanity, with it down to facts and stats. It's insanity. Listen, my name is not a number. My blood type, not letters. My ethnicity, not a faction. My culture, not creed. My language, not a syllabus. My religion, not a business. My occupation, not just the way the latest table with food. Don't you ever dare tell me I'll amount to no good. And if they dare to take a swing, you gotta dare to take a hit. They wear an iron fist, but the gloves don't fit, so it don't hurt. Believe me, they can't even hack it. Like a 20 cent man in a thousand dollar jacket. Like a 20 cent man in a thousand dollar jacket. I guess that makes them first world diamond necklace pearls with a man across the street and his little girl are busy selling tissue. A little tissue empire. Kind of like your MNC, but just a little higher. He lifts her on his shoulders so she can see a little higher. And what does she see? She sees her wealth. She's rich. And not the first definition, redefining her terms, cashing in, believing. Rich, having a high value or quality. Rich, magnificently impressive in quality. Rich, deep and vivid in color, sense, or smell. Arista or billionaire, nobody can tell. And why should they? What exactly are you investing? Stocks, bonds, life, love? Why not throw the rest in? Life's a big melting pot, can't just use one flavor. Do yourself a favor and save your money, but more importantly, your soul. Because one can hold you out, the other make you whole. Your life is a checkbook. Pages are your days. Write carefully and sign off the trills you want to blaze. Don't count five million with the flick of a hand. Count five million once for every man. And maybe in some facets we won't be number one, but we'll be happy when the harvest is done. Sign the bottom line, it doesn't matter which. Make peace with your heart, and you'll always be rich. Thank you. <laughs> uh, All right, so Ben, what have we taught these wonderful people today? <laughs> Oh, that we are a bunch of angsty, depressed little boys. Yeah, no, um, pretty much. But honestly, um, I think it's such a great thing to uh, be able to have empathy um, and to value that capacity for empathy in you and to always 
embrace your awkwardness and vulnerability. Keep it weird, keep it real, and know that the things that hurt you will never cut deep enough to change who you really are. That's beautiful, bro. Thank you. You know what, this reminds me of, uh, of my time when I was young. Mm -hmm. Because um, when I was a young boy, I was really oft confused. The other guys in class didn't seem the same. They'll be kicking balls of different sorts and running around the fields, and I just sit there with my pet chameleon, Larry. Blending in as well as he, but they still pick on me with all their hurtful words and various stationery. Hey, me too! <laughs> It dawned on me that I was made a little differently I'm not so hairy, not quite very hairy I realized that I was just a manly, unmanly man, unmanly man We're not that great at math or sports, but we smell better Unmanly man, unmanly man, and through it all we'll be unmanly men. When Christmas comes around each year, there's many things I love. From turkey, ham, and Christmas cake, and mini turtle doves. But the one thing that I can't deny always makes my heart stop is a fresh collection of Christmas soaps from the body shop. We're not that into football leagues and things like pickup trucks. We won't be army officers, but we'll make fantastic clerks. PE classes, hell on earth. We're always picked the last. Fuck my my words. We'll still kick your ass in yoga. Unmanly man, unmanly man. We still like jokes, but unlike you, we're way more sensitive. Unmanly man. Unmanly man, we sit through chick flicks because we're unmanly men. Grey's Anatomy, Gossip Girl, One Tree Hill and Charmed. I watched these shows so much my parents often got alarmed. Puberty came late for me, which got me pretty pissed. Cause up till the age of 17, I still sounded like this. I like films like Birdman cause they're really, really deep. I write poetry and cry myself to sleep. Guys show off to girls with V8 engines in their Maseratis. We show off to girls by taking them to the opera. opera. What's a Maserati? Isn't that like a pasta? No, silly! That's Lamborghini. Um, <laughs> unmanly man, unmanly man. We are basically male feminists. Unmanly man, unmanly man. We're the designated drivers after Zoom. Down. Testosterone is overrated. I can be creatively castrated. My Instagram is full of trees and oceans. Let's sit in Starbucks and talk about emotions. I can tell the different shades of blusher. I can pull off all the moves like Usher. You think she'd be impressed with Metallica and Slayer? I just have to pull out a little John Mayer. Oh, emotional song about trains. Oh, I'm manly man. Unmanly man, we can't change tires, but we'll help you call an Uber. Unmanly man, unmanly man, unmanly man will someday rule the world. Uh, candles, moisturizer, paper cow, Polaroid, wristbands, guy liner, logs on the beach, John Green, Juice Clan, vlogging, Beyonce, Tumblr, TEDx, Fart Cats, Aloha!